Okay, so I'm waiting on Janine. Okay. okay, we're ready to go. Good evening. It is Thursday, October 15th, 2020. And I am delighted to introduce Tammy Bowling, a five year metastatic breast cancer survivor. That is my word, survivor, for somebody who has not wasted her cancer experience. Tammy is co founder of Metavivors of New Jersey and a co producer of Light Up NBC, which she's going to tell you about later. Tammy was diagnosed at the age of 41 with no family history, two young daughters with de novo metastatic breast cancer. And I've asked her to please explain what that means because most people don't understand that someone could have metastatic disease. So we'll define metastatic and we'll define de novo, um, particularly when there's such a push for early detection saving lives. So Tammy, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Uh, yeah, it was really out of the blue. I was 41 years old. I had lived in Manhattan for about 20 years and it was finally time to make the move to the suburbs. My children were two and four years old and I thought to myself, oh, let me just get an internal medicine doctor now that I'm living in another state. And I went to the doctor and she said, oh, clean bill of health. She did a breast exam, no lumps. And she just said, oh, just make sure you go get your mammogram. It had been about a year and a half since my baseline and the baseline had been clear, no history of breast cancer in my family. And lo and behold, I go for the mammogram and they said, you know what? We got to do an MRI. And mm -hmm. I looked at her like she was crazy. Like, what do you mean? You just told me like I, last week, I just got a clean bill of health. They said, oh, it's probably just a cyst. Like, we, let's just do the MRI. And that led to some biopsies. And they did two biopsies in the left breast and two in the lymph node. And all three came back malignant. And, you know, my head was just spinning. I even said, you know, malignant, like, does that mean cancer? Like, do I have cancer? And she said, yes, but, you know, let's set up a time. We're going to get you, you know, let's see what the next step's going to be. So I met with four surgeons and two reconstructive surgeons, and I had a plan. I wanted to have a double mastectomy. I, I didn't care. I said, you know, take my, my boobs, my hair. Like, I, I just want to get this out. And they said, you know what? Since it's in, in your lymph nodes, we should do a PET scan mm -hmm. just to make sure that it hasn't spread anywhere else in your body. And sure enough, it lit up in my liver. And that's when they told me that having surgery would not prolong my life. That's when they told me that it was actually incurable stage four metastatic breast cancer. And what that meant is that the cancer had already left the primary organ of the breast and traveled elsewhere in the body. And because of that, it was called de novo, D-E-N-O-V-O which only happens really in six to 10% of the population where you are diagnosed at stage four off the bat without even having that chance um, of having a zero to three curable diagnosis. So I wanna ask you, did you have, you didn't have a palpable lump? I did not have a lump. I went for my routine mammogram having just done a boot camp workout the day before and that's where it was discovered really out of, out of the blue. And no other physical symptoms that would have indicated that something was wrong within your gut or your liver, nothing, fatigue. You know, I had had a cold for quite some time huh. and I had had pneumonia, uh, you know, and I guess my immune system was pretty worn down, but there was nothing to indicate that it would have been any type of cancer, you know, or, or breast cancer. And like I said, in fact, the internal medicine doctor had literally taken blood work the prior month and nothing had showed in the blood work. I mean, everything looked fine until I went for that mammogram and they saw what you can't see with your actual eye. So you go through treatment, which was probably quite long initial treatment. So you did not have a double mastectomy or did you? I didn't. I, you know, imagine just begging for a double mastectomy and being told, 
uh, we're sorry, but it's too late. I mean, wow. for all those people out there that can have this kind of surgery and have the chance to live cancer free. I, I mean, from my perspective, you're very fortunate because I never even had that opportunity. I wanted that surgery so badly. Um, but they did say the good news was that um, an oral chemotherapy had just been approved by the FDA three months before my diagnosis. That is why I raised money for research. That is the power of research, that this was available to me, something that had just come out three months before. And I decided to, to take this oral chemotherapy along with a hormone inhibitor and some other things to manage the disease. And I continue to get scanned every three months um, and just you know pray that my treatment continues to work and that science continues to have the next treatment that I will need to keep staying alive. So um, like you, I've been a consumer reviewer for the Department of Defense, and it was a real eye opener to me. I used to think that there was a secret cure until I became a consumer reviewer and just completely saw how complex this disease is with all the types and subtypes. Your treatment, you said, you, you, have you been on the same treatment protocol since your diagnosis or has that changed? I have been, but uh, many people change treatments, you know, every few months or, or every year. Um, as you probably know, the average life expectancy of this diagnosis is two to three years mm -hmm. uh, upon diagnosis and only about 10% make it 10 years. We do have to say there are a number of outliers out there who are living 15, 20, 25 years with this disease, and yet they can't really determine who lives and who dies. In but they are real people. Actually, that's what I said to someone when I heard, I said, wait, you've been living with metastatic for 18 years. Are you sure you're not an avatar? <laughs> and uh, yeah. they said, no, you know, so there, there are real people. And, and that does, that does give us hope. And um, I continue to have a mantra, which is um, faith, hope, and love. I think it's important for everyone to think about what are the three things that they need in their life um, that they need to be happy and those are mine. So every night before I go to bed, I just say, well, if I have faith and hope and love, uh, I can be, be happy and hopeful. You know, many people who have not had breast cancer and certainly don't understand meta metastatic disease might meet you and you might share in conversation that you have metastatic breast cancer and they might look at you and say, but you don't look sick. How do you handle comments like that? Yes, you know, I think there are so many things these days that can be invisible illnesses, you know, um, whether it's, you know, mental health or, you know, even diabetes or even MS. I mean, you know, you just never know what someone is going through. And, um, you know, metastatic patients are in treatment for the rest of their lives. Um, so, what I do is I, I, I try to educate people. I actually formed Metavivors of New Jersey, which is the first chapter of Metaviver Research and Support. And it's a Facebook group. Uh, we have a bit, bit over 500 members and it was designed to educate families, friends, and patients about metastatic disease, ways to advocate, how you can help you know, I didn't necessarily want to send an article to my mom on the disease, but I felt like if I could post it in this group, she could digest it when she was ready. Mm. And that's what started happening, that the family members and the caregivers of patients are able to access this information and consume it when they're ready to. So is this group just for New Jersey, this Facebook group? For your chapter? It started as um, something for New Jersey because we were advocating for um, different types of laws and establishing October 13th as National Metastat as Metastatic Breast Cancer Awareness Day for the state of New Jersey. But then because so many caregivers had joined, um, now there's people in it from all different states. And actually anyone can join it. You just can go on Facebook and look up uh, Metavivors of NJ. Perfect. 
So let's talk about MetaViber and you being the co-founder of Light Up MBC. Um, for people who don't know what that means, and by the way, metastatic breast cancer is every day, but they've designated one day to really highlight it. And this year across the country, more than 100 buildings were light up in, I think, three to four colors. Yes. So MetaViver designed a ribbon that is more than just pink. I, you know, most people associate the pink ribbon with early stage and survivorship, but metastatic patients feel left out in that conversation because we try to thrive with the disease. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, it, it, it's a difficult diagnosis and 115 people die every single day of metastatic breast cancer. And this ribbon is green to represent the cycle of life over death, teal to represent healing and spirituality, but then it has pink in it to represent that the cancer originated in the breast, but it's so much more than that. So this year, our goal, um, was to have 115 buildings light up around the country in these symbolic metastatic colors of green, teal, and pink. Light Up MBC is actually a campaign designed by an organization called More Fight, More Strong. Hmm. And they designed this campaign with all the proceeds to benefit Metaviver research and support. I was excited to be the co-producer this year of Light Up NBC Live, which aired the evening of October 13th. And it was a virtual event where I was able to Zoom to people, actually Light Up NBC ambassadors, people living with metastatic breast cancer and caregivers across the country from Chicago to Iowa to Minneapolis. And they stood in front of their landmarks and told their story and showed all the viewers on the show how beautiful their landmarks lit in their city. Um, and a lot of people just were happy to have a platform to share their stories and to your point, really educate people on metastatic breast cancer. Uh, we also had some amazing just musical performances that tied in nicely with the theme. Shannon Curtis sings an amazing song called Constellation which is all about the light that we put out into the world mm. and how together that forms a constellation. Um, and we had some just great pieces on some metastatic thrivers. So I can, I can follow up with the link if anyone's interested in watching that. Absolutely, that would be great. I, I do know when I was first diagnosed and women that I would meet would pass away from the disease and they weren't called survivor anymore. And that really bothered me because I felt that it didn't, that word survivor doesn't really define somebody's life. And when they're, they're dead, they're no longer surviving. And then that felt terrible to the family and friends. So I came up with this term survivor, which is what I think all of you uh, women and men who have metastatic disease are doing. You have, you come together in a very powerful way, primarily an all volunteer group to, and I, I've said before, um, they're locked and loaded. They're, they're pissed off. They're done waiting for somebody to do something. Can you share the power of the research that MetaViber has funded um, a little bit about how they make some of those funding decisions? And is some of that research really cutting edge? Sure. Well, I mean, one of the, one of the most amazing things about MetaViber is that they only have two people that work for the organization. I mean, it is really a volunteer organization and, and even their salaries are funded through operational grants, not through donor dollars. So 100% of every donation to Metaviver goes directly to stage four metastatic research. And there are some organizations out there that might do prevention of, of metastatic disease. Metaviver really focuses on treatment for the already metastasized patient. It actually um, is a statistic that 20 to 30% of early stage breast cancers do return as stage four. Mm -hmm. And it is sad that right now only 5% of overall U.S. breast mm -hmm. cancer research funding goes to metastatic disease. 
if we can solve stage four, we can actually solve all the stages, right? So over the last 10 years, Metaviver has funded 106 grants totaling $13.6 million. And there is a, a scientific review board and, and a grant process that they go through. Um, in fact, we just had one of the scientists from Memorial Sloan Kettering speak on Light Up NBC Live the other night about the work that he's doing with the grant that Metaviver uh, gave to him. Um, as well as a professor from Vanderbilt who spoke. So um, it, it is a pretty thorough grant review process for how they award the grants. Last year alone, they gave over $5 million um, in 2019. But as you said, with COVID this year, um, it's so much tougher for, you know, for so many nonprofits. And uh, we've all heard the term, you know, cancer doesn't stop. And um, we need more research to extend the lives. Um, of metastatic patients. So how can other um, individuals like yourself get involved with Metaviber, whether raising money? I know that you had your Metscarades events, which I think had to go virtual. So those are kind of not happening. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you can accept a direct donation to the website. Oh, of course, you can just go to um, metaviver.org mm -hmm. and you can donate there. Or if you want to find out a little bit more about Light Up MBC, you can go to metaviver.org slash, like forward slash, Light Up MBC. And you can get more information, you can donate. And if you would like to try to get a landmark in your city to yeah. show unity and show support mm -hmm. for next year, um, you can start start to see, you know, about that. You can also follow More Fight, More Strong on Facebook. It's M-O-O-R-E, fight, and then M-O-O-R-E, strong. And you'll be able to see lots of pictures there of all the different landmarks that lit up for the cause this year. I know lots of sports stadiums participated. So that's kind of an easy one. Every, every city has as sports stadiums. That was amazing. I mean, uh, American Airlines Arena, the home of the Miami Heat participated and the Rocket Fieldhouse in Cleveland, you know, with the, with the Cavaliers participated, Philadelphia Eagles uh, Stadium participated. So um, we had some- Here in Detroit, Ford Field, where I'm from. Ford, absolutely, right? Ford Field and Uniroyal Tire in Detroit. Yes, yes. That was, that was only the second time that the tires ever lit in its history, apparently. Um, so I think that more and more awareness is happening for metastatic disease. And just going back to one of your points about the passion of this community, every year in October, Metaviver hosts something called the Stage 4 Stampede in Washington. And you can find out information on the website about it. And we go down and we, and we march and we they ring a bell for the 115 lives lost that day because we know that's happening. And we you know, have some moments of silence and then we go to the House and the Senate and we lobby for better laws for metastatic patients. One of them is called the MBC Access to Care Act. Right now you have to wait five months until you can get social security disability. Even if you've worked, even if you have the credits you know, into the system. And that's really tough for people because if they're in treatment and they're not feeling well, you know, they need the funds immediately. So this NBC Access to Care Act actually waives that five month waiting period. That's one of the things we're lobbying for. And right now you have to be on social security disability for two years before you can qualify for Medicare. And with an average of mm -hmm. two to three years, I mean, how is that? how is that acceptable? So this bill is saying that those waiting periods should be waived. And when we lobby for things like this, and when I've been there, you know, we are literally fighting for our lives. And the bond of people, you know, when they feel this is life or death, I mean, we, we need more research. We need it sooner than the seven years that it typically takes to go from mouse to market. You know, we need people to come together like they're doing for COVID. Yes, exactly. Right? Around the world, mm -hmm. you know, are, are sharing more information so that they can get a vaccine done quicker. You know, we don't have the time to wait seven years. Um, and that's really, you know, what I, you know, try to say to any of the, the scientists and 
um, companies out there who will listen, there is no cure for metastatic breast cancer. And that's why stage four needs more. So this is the perfect time for me to jump in and mention the Pink Fund's Mary Herzog Fund. Yes. So this fund is in memory of Mary Herzog who passed away some years ago, young. And it's specifically for women or men who have been diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer who have applied and been approved for social security disability, but are in that five month wait period. So in that case, you can apply for support for the pink fund and we will cover some of your non-medical bills for housing, transportation, utilities, and insurance for six months. So we give you that extra bonus month. Now it's six months, $6,000, but if you, if you come to us and you only have three more months to wait, we can still give you $6,000. So it's a cap of 6,000 per patient. It's not enough all the time, but I describe it as, um, I use the Jenga game as, a, as an example, like you have this tower of your life and all these, all these blocks are being pulled out and your stability is compromised. And so what we try to do with the Mary Herzog Fund and our general fund, which is for three months, is to put some scaffolding around you to kind of stabilize you until you can get to bridge over to the next place, uh, find a new plan or find additional means of support. So um, we want to encourage people who are listening who may have metastatic disease or have a family member who has metastatic disease to get on the website, click on the get help button, fill out the application. Applications are reviewed every single week and approved every single week. Um, generally can take 30 days, depending if you have all the supporting documentation. So, and if you are on social security disability and you still need financial support, um, if it's SSDI, I believe that you can still get up to 90 days of support for the pink fund, or you're not applying for social security disability, but you are in treatment for metastatic disease and you're unable to work. So now you may be unable to work because of your treatment protocol, or maybe it's simply because of COVID, you're immunocompromised and you've decided to self-select out of the workforce, whether you're an essential or non-essential worker. So if you go to the website and click on get help. Um, I want to talk about yeah. Sorry, I just I just want to say that I I think that's so incredible, and I so appreciate the Pink Fund, um, you know, stepping up to the plate, and you know now in, in you know including the metastatic community in what you're doing, and I think that you know we it's so important to to live with purpose, and I've always believed that you know what you put out into the world mm -hmm. you get back, and um, I just think that. That you're doing something that's incredible that's impacting people's lives in a big so way. I, I think I want to, I was going to try to see if I could read this one. Maybe she wasn't metastatic, but the thank you notes that we receive from people tell us that they can sleep better at night, they you know, can relax, concentrate on their treatment, that kind of thing. We've had some patients in general tell us that they scheduled surgery, they had their surgery, but they didn't schedule chemotherapy because they couldn't afford not to work. And so they weren't gonna have treatment. And then once our, we, they got the email that our bills, their bills would be paid for 90 days, they called their oncologist and said, let's go. So that's, that's a pretty powerful uh, testimonial to the kind of relief that we provide. So I want to go back to ringing the bell. So we talked about ringing the bell for NBC. Um, I know there are some people out there who, really, and this may be a little controversial, have resented ringing the bell when you're done with chemo. Because like you said, 30%, 20 to 30% of women diagnosed at any stage with breast cancer can recur and become metastatic. And they have said they will never be able to ring that bell. Do you have any insight into that? How do you feel about that? Yeah. I mean, look, I, I guess I'm mixed about it. I'm I'm happy for the people who can ring the bell, right? I mean, chemo is not an easy thing for anybody to go through. And there is a sense of, wow, um, I was in this dark tunnel and I'm out, right? Like I finished mm -hmm. treatment. But if you're sitting next to someone who's getting an infusion, who's metastatic, yeah. who will never be able to ring that bell, it's hard enough as it is for them sitting there 
thinking, wow, like I'll never be able to ring that bell. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so, you know, I think, you know, people that are finished should deserve to ring it, but they should also maybe be sensitive to who's around them when they're ringing it. Yeah. And know that metastatic patients feel like we're in this tunnel where there's, there's really no, no light at the end of the tunnel because there is no cure. And so this is the one time in my life where I'm praying for a lot of traffic in the tunnel <laughs> so that um, I can be there comfortably um, until we can turn metastatic from a deadly illness into a chronic one. And when you see all the advances with AIDS and MS and diabetes, we know that it's possible. Yeah, so you're hopeful, very hopeful. And in your case, like you said, a drug came on the market three months prior to your diagnosis that well, has allowed you to live for five more years and longer. Exactly, exactly. And, and that's why I'm so passionate about raising funds for research. And in fact, uh, the Light Up NBC Live event the other night raised $101,000, which will you know directly fund a metastatic research grant. That's wonderful. And you know what's great about that is that it's not just lighting up a building. There's a real purpose behind it. It's education and raising money to find important research. So exactly. let's talk about your mantra. Okay. <laughs> Make every day meaningful. So, so yeah. many of us, I have to confess that in this COVID situation, I'm not dealing with metastatic breast cancer. I hope I never have to, but sometimes I'm having issues around meaningful and I don't have that in the back of my head all the time. So how do you make every day meaningful and what practical tips can you give those of us uh, living in these unprecedented times as well as metastatic patients uh, to provide them with, with hope for the future? Well, I, I love the quote that uh, it's not happy people who are grateful, it's grateful people who are happy. Yeah. And so I really do believe that finding gratitude is a, a big key to happiness. And so you have to ask yourself, like, what can you be doing to be grateful every day for what you do have? And instead of, you know, trying to think about it as um, like a really deep, hard thing, you could say, you know what, I am so grateful for that hot cup of hazelnut coffee I had this morning because I could taste it and it was warm and it just made me feel good. Or I was so grateful today to be able to take that walk in the fresh air and feel good. And, and Or I was so grateful to not feel pain this morning um, or you know, see the, the blue sky or have music that I enjoy listening to. So I think it's really great to think of your senses and what you're able to do each day. Every night, I, my mind is filled with gratitude of just, oh, I went to my child's soccer game or you know, I got to make smoothies with my daughter or um, you know, I ate something or tried something new to eat, you know, all different things. And I wake up every morning just excited to enjoy the next day. So despite the diagnosis, my, my, bar, my bar for happiness is really being alive. And that's what I often tell people, you know, you wake up each day and for that, I'm grateful. So I have a tip that I used some years ago with my children, um, which was I gave them a big ball jar and I gave them multicolored sticky notes. Mm -hmm. And I asked them each day to date it and at the end of the day, or even the beginning of the day, write down something for which they were grateful and then they could fold it up and put it in the jar. And at the end of the year, they needed to take it out and look at that. Mm -hmm. I gave them a second jar, which was their worry jar. Yes. Also with sticky notes. And again, they were to put all that in the worry jar and leave it in the jar, you know, mentally, try to. And then at the end of the year, pull those out and say, well, gosh, that wasn't as scary as I thought it would be, or it didn't happen, or it did happen, but I overcame it. So I think... Um, for me, I'm a really visual person. Another thing, if you don't want the jar, you can get the sticky notes and you can line your walls with them um, and make a beautiful rainbow of, of just the things for which you're grateful. And I know for all of us now, we're in a, a time of political upheaval and concerns about COVID, which 
there's so many um, analogies between COVID and, and cancer because it's people are fearful about it. Um, but like you, we have to find to get every day that we're given to making it meaningful. So thank you, Tammy Bowling, for being with us tonight. We look forward to show, having your video, this Facebook Live up on our website, on YouTube. And then we will have a link to Light Up NBC Great. and to MetaViber. And I want to thank Exact Sciences, the makers of the Oncotype DX, for sponsoring this segment. Thank you and good night.